Thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited to be hosting this webinar this morning and it's the soft launch for the Healthy Social Environments Framework. And um, BC Healthy Communities is a member of the advisory group that worked with the BC Centre for Disease Control over the last two years to develop this social environments framework. And so we're pleased to offer our Zoom platform and some time to help organize to allow this soft launch to happen. So we're one of several of the advisory members that helped to develop this framework this morning. And those folks will be introduced as we move through the webinar. I'd also like to acknowledge that BC Healthy Communities in particular, we are located on the unceded territories of the Lekwungen people. And we recognize that doing a territorial acknowledgement is just one small piece of a broader picture in terms of thinking about the impact that colonialism has had on local Indigenous communities, First Nations communities, and you know, as, as part of our work across the province, we are starting with at least acknowledging the lands that we're living, working and playing on. So thank you for joining us this morning. I'm Jody Muka, the Executive Director of BC Healthy Communities and our work spans all across the province. We are a not-for-profit organization and we support healthy communities work in terms of having healthy, thriving, and resilient communities for everyone to live, work, play, and learn. So again, we're thrilled. Our work really does a key role in our work that we play is to support social connectedness. And we saw this opportunity to be involved with the BC Center for Disease Control to develop this social environments framework as very complementary to our work. And again, we participated as a member of the advisory and we're pleased to be able to support the launch this morning. And we will be looking to use this framework in the work that we do across the province with all the communities that we serve. So very pleased to be with you here with you today. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Sherito Galing and Tanis Cheadle, who will be walking you through the social environments framework. I will start by introducing Sherito. I've known Sherito for quite a long time and it's been my pleasure to work with her. She is the project manager at the BC Center for Disease Control and she oversees the healthy built environments portfolio. And really in Sherito's role, she facilitates cross sector collaboration and the development of practice tools that advance health promotion goals within community planning and designs. And she works closely with a wide range of stakeholders, including BC health authorities and local government professionals. And Sherito in her role also co-chairs co the Healthy Built Environment Alliance. She's committed to collaborative processes and a spirit of reciprocity. And she believes that the innovation and change we need can only happen by working together across sectors and silos. Sherito lives, works, and plays in Vancouver within the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples. And next, I will introduce Tanis Cheadle. Tanis is a health systems consultant, and she coordinates the development of the social environments framework. And so we've worked very closely with her over the past two years. And in her previous role at Provincial Health Services Authority, PHSA, Tanis led the creation of the original Healthy Built Environment Linkages Toolkit, which this framework supports. And as a consultant over the past seven years, she's continued to lead the development of a wide range of companion resources, including mental health and well-being considerations for the built environment. So Tanis is also thankful for the opportunity to collaborate with, learn from, and be inspired by the many passionate people working to create healthy, vibrant communities. And Tanis as well lives in Vancouver and is living, living and working within the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples. So it's at this point, I will now hand it over to Sherido to get us started with the content of this webinar, which is Healthy Social Environments Framework. 
over to you, Sherito. Great. Thank you, Jody. That was a really nice introduction. I appreciate that. <laughs> and it's so nice to be with all of you this morning. We're so impressed and pleased with the, with the level of interest in our webinar and also slightly intimidated. <laughs> so um, we're looking forward to speaking with you about this new healthy social environment framework um, that we've been working on for the past two years, as Jody mentioned. And um, just to start off, uh, Tanith and I are speaking from the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish people and respectfully work to support and amplify voices of Indigenous leaders, past, present, and emerging. In the process of developing this framework, we learned from the Indigenous teachings that the land around us is part of who we are. It reflects our histories. And as we present, we invite you to reflect on how social connections show up in your local community, who is disconnected and why, and how does the built-in infrastructure of your neighborhood reflect and shape this? We're aiming to leave you with a sense of inspiration and hope that we can increase connections in our communities together, and we'll give you some tools to do that. We're going to introduce the concept of healthy social environments, the work we've been doing to better understand it and how it can be influenced, and to capture this learning in a new healthy social environments framework. We're going to define what we mean by the social environment and we'll focus on the practical aspects of the draft framework instead of the specific content or methodology. So just to be clear, this is a soft launch. Um, and what we're launching today is three draft documents that summarize key aspects of the healthy social environments framework. And Tanis is gonna go through that in more detail. We expect to release the full final report in February and materials will be posted and we'll share, we'll share them along with our PowerPoint slides and the recording after the call. Next slide, please. So um, the reason why we started this project two years ago is because there's been such growing interest in the role of social connections in promoting individual and population health. Um, we referenced the 2017 annual report that Ontario Chief MHO, Dr. David Williams, uh, released. He talks about the negative health impacts of social isolation, disconnection, and lack of trust. He says people who are isolated have a 50% greater risk of dying early than those with strong social connections, which is the same impact as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. He also says people with a weak sense of community are much more likely to be in the top 5% of healthcare users, which accounts for more than 50% of total healthcare spending. And people who are socially disconnected are less, oh, sorry, people who are socially disconnected have less social support and they are less likely to receive help from others, which could make a critical difference in times of crisis and emergency. And we are seeing how important equity and social connections are right now with COVID-19. We are connected in a way that is made very clear. As we experience COVID-19, we see that when people feel excluded or disconnected from community, they are less likely to trust their public institutions, follow health, public health directives. They'll do things like hoard toilet paper, they'll resist wearing masks, and they'll have mass parties during a pandemic. For example, when people feel disconnected, our community well being decreases. If people experience a high degree of social capital and connectedness, they'll care about their neighbors and they'll go out of their way to take care of those in our community that are most at risk. So we know that people with higher levels of social well being are less anxious and depressed, and they report higher levels of trust and cooperativeness. They are happier and healthier and better able to take charge of their lives and find solutions to challenges they may face. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna introduce you to three important words in the framework, how they're related and how they're different. And those words are social connectedness, social environments and community well-being. To start with social connections, are not always positive. They can be negatively experienced and not everyone experiences the public health, public space as a neutral thing. Um, and we see that using our equity lens. 
we define social connectedness as the degree to which you feel connected to other people and have a sense of belonging in your communities. And more specifically, we, we're referring to one's degree of social capital or access to resources and support, social co cohesion or belonging, and social inclusion or participation. Social connection can be measured, for example, through frequency of contact with others, personal relationships, and engagement in the community. Jody's team at Plan H did a report on social connectedness, which found that 32% of British Columbians do not feel a sense of belonging in their local community, which is concerning. Social connectedness is an important protective factor for individuals and communities. However, it is not consistently defined in the research or in our public understanding, and it requires collaboration across sectors and practical guidance in order to be influenced. Health authorities and our partners are looking for a common frame of reference that makes sense to diverse stakeholders who are held to different mandates and protocols and require practical resources for guidance on what to do. Next slide, please. So the social environment, what is it anyway? Um, so unlike social connections, which can be measured, the social environment is the invisible and the taken for granted. Um, the definition we landed on after reviewing the, the literature and hearing feedback from content experts is that the social environment describes the underlying social, cultural, and economic context within which we live. It includes all of the structures and processes we create, the relationships we have, and the actions we take to organize and improve our lives. We see it as present at multiple levels. So that ranges from macro level global systems to cities, towns, and neighborhoods to family level interpersonal relationships. It is relationship-based. It refers to relationships between people, between people and their communities, and between communities and communities. These relationships shape our ideas and our shared values and influence how we move about public spaces and how we structure our social norms. It's comprised of multiple interconnected features. Um, and this framework is our attempt to capture those things. It looks at 10 key local features as interconnected and embodying both social and built characteristics. And Tanis will say more about that. The social environment is also influenced by the history of power relations that have become institutionalized over time. And as I mentioned, you can't see the social environment. It can, you can think of it as the water in which we swim. However, when crisis comes, it can be recognized as, oh, as crisis comes, it can be recognized as does our collective ability to shift it, sometimes dramatically so. To describe the dynamic nature of this social environment, our advisors shared an analogy of an avalanche that if you find yourself in an avalanche, it's possible to swim to the top of the snow when it's fluid and in motion. And when the avalanche stops, everything sets again in a new landscape. So we're embedded in social connections. And as we experience this pandemic, we are also experiencing our incredible ability as social beings to pivot and adapt to seismic changes in our public life. As everything is moving around us, what is normally invisible has become more visible. Our awareness of our local and micro communities is heightened, systemic inequities are more apparent, and new social environments have been created as we connect in different ways. The unanswered question to be seen is how will we integrate these new learnings, values, and ways of being in relationship with each other before the snow sets as we turn towards rebuilding efforts post-COVID? We have an opportunity now to keep our collective sites firmly elevated towards the idea and goal of community well-being. And I'm just going to go quickly through these next slides because I see that um, time is ticking. So next slide, community well-being. Community well-being is our long-term goal. Um, it's greater than the sum of individual well-beings in a community. Mm -hmm. We see it as a middle scale measurement that fits between individual and regional or national well-being. We refer to the definition from dialogue, 
um, which is on the screen there, and I won't read it out, but what we like about this definition is that it emphasizes that these conditions are self-identified by individuals and communities. And to, su to support this self-determination, our intention with this framework is to offer guiding principles in order to start conversations. And we avoid being overly prescriptive about how these principles should be enacted. Next slide. So the goal of this project is to develop a conceptual framework that summarizes the most influential aspects of local neighborhoods that contribute to community well-being and identify evidence-based principles to guide action. It's a companion resource to another called the Built Environment Linkages Toolkit, um, which was initiated with a focus on the built environment and physical well-being outcomes. And so we're considering the five features of community design that are commonly re referenced in built environment discourse. So those are the five that you see there, neighborhood design, housing, food systems, natural environments, and transportation. And we're layering on five new, new additional assets which align more closely with social planning realms. And those are arts and culture, recreation, civic engagement, local economy, and service environments. We've conducted a two-year review study which we're just in the final stages of completing. And as a conceptual framework to describe what healthy social environments is, we focus on these 10 features and how they interact or enable or detract from positive social connections. And we anticipate that our users would, would like to use both as complementary resources. Next slide. This is a... Um, just to go over the methodology that we took, and I don't think I'll spend too much time on this, but just to say that from our experiences developing practice frameworks, we've learned that the most sought after resources are evidence-based and built in true collaboration with stakeholders and end users. And we took the same with this resource. We consulted 31 local government and health authority reps, completed a scoping review on each of the 10 features, we synthesized and assessed about 2,000 health-related research findings, and we're now conducting final cons consultation with close to 100 stakeholders. We found an abundance of research findings, and those findings, along with the content expert feedback, um, including outreach to Indigenous communities that was facilitated by BC Healthy Communities, all of that informed the development of 51 draft evidence-based practice principles to guide the development of healthier social environments. Um, next slide, please. And we had the profound good fortune of working with a phenomenal group of advisors. Um, a few of them will be speaking in a few minutes, um, who guided us along the way in this project, as well as our researchers, Kelsey, Alexis, Ashmali, and Selena, who put in countless hours reviewing and assessing the research findings. And we wanted to show just a few of the many people who've been engaged because we are so immensely grateful for their support. But we also wanted to highlight that this framework is born from an intentionally collaborative process. And as Claire Graham put it at our last meeting, she said, the process of how we built the framework is how we anticipate people using it. It is the start of a conversation that is inclusive, collaborative, and ever evolving. And that's the spirit in which we developed this resource. And I'll let Tanis go through the components of the framework itself. Thank you. Thanks, Sherito. That was a great introduction. It's wonderful to see going to spend the next few minutes reviewing the components of the framework from a very high level and I'll go through it from inner to outer. There's a lot to cover so I'm sorry but I have to speak really quickly. Um, before I do that I just want to highlight some of the key themes in the research and consultation that really stood out and significantly informed the framework. So the first theme is the importance of context. When deciding if interventions are right for your community, it's important to consider factors such as your location, population, existing health issues, and community preferences. Rather than a prescriptive set of rules, this framework provides a starting point to ask the right questions in your local context. The second theme is inclusive and meaningful community engagement. We strongly encourage every community to engage its residents to identify their unique challenges and priorities and generate their own solutions. 
I also wanted to note that this framework doesn't attempt to consider all the nuances for different communities. So for example, ones based on culture, language, age, just to name a few. We really wanted to design a framework that can be adapted by a wide range of communities to meet their own unique needs. Finally, the last theme is interconnections. What we mean by that is that the 10 features and their principles are mutually reinforcing. And we heard Sherito speak to that, but I just wanted to reiterate it because it was such a prominent theme. I also want to acknowledge what is not in scope. The framework aligns with and acknowledges Indigenous holistic ways of knowing, but it is not tailored for Indigenous audiences. Our intention was to provide evidence-based content in a way that lends itself to adaptation for different purposes, including culturally specific interpretations. We also recognize and appreciate the extensive body of work on the social determinants of health as a foundational piece needed to influence well-being as far upstream as possible. In fact, the BCCDC currently has a project on this topic underway and those findings will be released shortly. We, we want to emphasize that the principles highlighted in this framework are only one small piece of a much larger system that also needs to be addressed. In the interest of time, we're covering all of these components very quickly today, like warp speed actually. So please be rest assured that after the webinar, we will be sharing handout materials for you to use, I promise. Next slide, please. Let's take a look now at the framework components. Those gray inner interlocking pentagons represent equity and sustainability. They are the foundation of the entire framework. They represent what we're trying to achieve, but also the approach that we want to use to get there. The first value is equity. Equity means that everyone has a fair opportunity to reach their full potential without disadvantage caused by their social, economic, or environmental circumstances. This is so front and center right now. As Dr. Teresa Tam noted in her 2020 annual report, the COVID-19 pandemic has jolted our collective consciousness into recognizing that equity is vital for ensuring health security. So we've highlighted on this slide the components of an equity approach and we'll provide more detail on this in the handouts. In an equity approach, truth and reconciliation is pursued as a multi-generational goal and meaningful inclusive opportunities for truth and reconciliation are actively encouraged and supported. In an equity approach, cultural safety is pursued through respectful engagement that recognizes and strives to address power imbalances. Cultural humility is pursued through a process of self-reflection to understand and address personal and systemic biases. In an equity approach, individuals and families from different cultures and communities see themselves represented and feel welcome, safe, and at ease within the community. Diversity in governance and decision-making groups is prioritized. Diversity is defined in broad terms, viewed as an asset, it's sought out, and it's embraced. In an equity approach, inclusivity is paramount. All voices are included, heard, and valued. Proactive efforts are taken to seek out those who are often excluded from community conversations and steps are taken to not only remove barriers to their participation, but to elevate their voices in decision making. In an equity approach, services and amenities are available, affordable, acceptable and accessible. The second value is sustainability, social, economic and environmental sustainability. In pursuing sustainability, a one planet living approach is taken. The planet is seen as our home rather than as containing hazards and animals that need to be controlled. We see healthy people, healthy animals, and a healthy planet as being intimately connected and fundamental to world health and happiness. Healthy community environments and healthy communities are addressed in tandem rather than separately and climate change is prioritized. The seventh generation principle is followed, which holds that in our every deliberation, we must consider the impact of our decisions on the next seven generations. In pursuing sustainability, community members are equal partners in designing their environments, not just voices to be included at the table. Communities are mindful of the seven sacred teachings of Indigenous people, love, respect, humility, truth, wisdom, honesty, and courage. A multi-solving approach is taken and co-benefits are achieved meaning one action has multiple outcomes. Sustainable communities are economically, environmentally, and socially healthy and resilient. Community members trust each other and have high levels of social connection. 
governments, organizations, and communities value and build in flexibility so they can respond nimbly and effectively to emerging challenges. So those are our underlying values. Let's take a look at the other framework components. Next slide, please. The framework contains a suite of practice principles for each of the 10 features. One subtle nuance is that on all the feature icons, half the color, half the circle is colored and half is white. And that signals that each feature has a built environment aspect and social environment aspect. Let's just look briefly at the transportation principles as an example of what we mean by that. So as you can see on this slide, the built environment principles are related to the physical environment. The social environment principles, on the other hand, are people oriented. There are things like promotion, marketing, communication, and interventions that support reductions in car use in favor of more active transport. A really good example of this is the creation of bike lanes. So you can build the bike lane and put physical barriers between the cars and the bikes. But the social environment part of the equation, if you want people to actually use the bike lane, is that you need to promote it, change attitudes and beliefs, let people know it's there and that it's safe, and let them know there are many connected bike routes available. Unfortunately, we don't have time in this webinar to go through all the principles for each feature, but we will include the entire list in our post webinar package. Next slide, please. So this outer ring of the framework depicts macro level concepts that came up consistently in stakeholder feedback. We didn't have capacity, unfortunately, to search for these in our lit reviews, but we did feel they were very valuable to include as concepts to inform planning. Tools and facilitators like technology, media, public policies, and health promotion can support, influence, or enhance the impact of all 10 features. These things also have the potential to create negative impacts on the features of community well being. Similarly, power dynamics, leadership and governance, and respectful discourse also have the potential to support or detract from a community's health. So we want to always be asking ourselves how we can leverage tools and political contexts to support the achievement of community well-being and at the same time try to foresee and identify how to mitigate situations that may detract from it. Next slide please. So this slide shows the conceptual pathway of how the components flow. I love this slide. I mean, I made it, but still, this is how all the pieces fit together and build on each other. Starting from the left, the framework asserts that if we pursue principles related to the 10 features and we apply the values when we implement social environment and built environment interventions, we can achieve positive social connections in the short to medium term and community well being in the long term. And I just want to note that within these principles, when we use the term interventions, because I've used that term a few times, we're talking about things listed here like policies, regulations, programs, and so forth. Again, we want to emphasize that all communities are unique. They're well positioned to identify their own definition of community well being. We do strongly suggest that every community consider a range of health related outcomes that assess population health, community health different forms of social connection and also assess achievement of the two core values. Now this is a proposed short list of potential categories of health related outcomes to use as a starting point and as I hear myself speak I, starting point is another theme in this framework. Communities would also need to identify specific indicators measures and tools to assess achievement of those outcomes but I, that's a whole other webinar potentially. Next slide please. So on this slide, we've listed some potential potential uses for the framework, and I suspect we'll see many of these uses being referenced by a few of our advisory group members who are going to share their reflections on practical applications of the framework. Now, this is the really exciting and expiring, not expiring, inspiring <laughs> part. <laughs> Next slide, please. All right, on that inspiring note, um, first I would like to introduce Pam Moore. Pam is one of the original HBE specialists in BC. In that role, she worked with municipal and regional governments to influence healthy community planning. More recently, she's been participating in Kelowna's Journey Home Task Force to address homelessness and designing and delivering the online Healthy Communities course at BCIT. 
The question Pam will be responding to is this, what has been your experience in trialing the framework in two BC communities and what opportunities does it offer in terms of broader stakeholder engagement and breaking down silos? Over to you, Pam. Thanks, Tanis. Um, good morning, everyone. I would like to acknowledge that I'm uh, presenting from the, boat, the sunny Okanagan and from the unceded territories of the Silex Nation. I trialed the social environment framework in two municipalities as part of a five day workshop on community safety and well being. Based on the subject matter, safety and well being, the participants were a broad range of disciplines, including policing, bylaw, community and social development landscaping, lighting, operations, engineering, parks, and planning. This is not your typical range of players that would normally attend a workshop on well-being. While safety usually makes us think of crime and criminal activity, tying it with, with well-being changed how participants address next steps and their actions going forward. At the first workshop, the pandemic had not started, so our discussion on the importance of social connection and cohesion was more theoretical with more many examples of communities and agencies that have created programs or resources and I believe Claire will talk about that next. The second workshop benefited from all of the evidence and research that has em emerged as a result of the pandemic. My experience with both workshops was that staff from different departments could see themselves as part of the discussion and see areas they could influence on how to address impacts to community members. The social environment framework was used to set the stage for diving deeper into identifying where and how staff could create influence or make changes to their roles as it relates to safety and well-being. What generated a lot of discussion with participants was a group activity of applying a health impact assessment to a park. This park would be considered as a good example of many of the design principles within the Healthy, and healthy Built Environment Toolkit. The park is well used and accessed during the day by multiple users and generations, but has criminal activity at night. This is not an unusual scenario in many of our parks today. So the question becomes how to determine which staff resources, i.e. time, money, programming, policies, etc are dedicated to these competing priorities, safety or multiple users? Or can there be a way to ensure that both are addressed and an equity lens applied? Both municipalities identified different ways that staff could become involved in park planning going forward. But more importantly, both municipalities have committed to next steps. One of the municipalities has created a cohort of multiple departments and will apply a full spectrum approach to community safety and well being, which includes elements from the framework. The other municipality, based on funding approval, will be using this framework to help identify the factors that impact household prosperity as a means to economic recovery for their community. The 10 features within the framework will be used along with the resident led engagement strategy to identify areas where the services, programs, policies may be enhanced or mod modified to improve household prosperity. Thanks. Thanks Pam for sharing your experiences and some of your current real world examples. Next, I would like to introduce Claire Graham. Claire is the Population Health Policy and Project Lead at Vancouver Coastal Health. The question Claire will be responding to is this. What are some current examples of social environment principles in action? What, which feature do they align with and how do they support social connection? And as Claire is speaking, Emily, if you could please pop up the next slide that shows the principles for arts and culture. That would be great. Thanks. Hi everyone, I am so delighted to be a part of this launch. I am so excited to see the kind of evidence base and effort to making these elements that as uh, Tana says, the invisible visible. Uh, they are very powerful elements. So I selected the arts and culture feature to give examples of action. And although to do all of this in the three minutes I've given requires a lot of creativity. 
Um, I selected it because like food, I think it's one of the more powerful vehicles for social connections at the individual level, at the group level, and at the societal level. It's also uh, extremely powerful in building connections intergenerationally and interculturally. Evidence also shows that arts-based programming can have an even greater impact on physical, mental health, and social connections than physical activity or just social, um, yeah, than physical activity. I'm part of a project that provides professional artist-led programming to groups of seniors who face multiple barriers to health. They might be the LGBTQ seniors, Cantonese-only speaking seniors, uh, First Nation elders, Punjabi seniors, almost all who participate come from low-income backgrounds, et cetera. Through the pandemic, I've been awed by the creative pivots that have taken place, but also how much of that has um, made more visible the inequities um, and how they've been exacerbated. And key to that is the digital divide. Um, while many of the programs could switch to an online format, quite a few could not. And so the artists have really, using that equity lens, rather than just leave those participants out, have switched formats to try and offer uh, letter writing pro projects and uh, love letter postcards, that kind of thing. They've also worked to try and use technology that is more familiar, telephones, trying to find ways of conference calling that doesn't require inputting a lot of numbers. So addressing those inequities so that the participation um, can maintain. Another group at Britannia Community Center linked up with the food delivery group to deliver cedar bark to elders so they could continue their online classes. Another de delivered 500 care packages to elders in the downtown east side in Strathcona who were afraid to go outside to help them celebrate the important mid-autumn festival. On warmer days, the group also arranged to have a harvest play outside a number of seniors' buildings. The songwriting group encouraged members to go outside in their neighborhood and record what was going on during COVID, which became part of the inspiration for a co-written COVID song. Struck by the rising awareness of the inequities that have surfaced during COVID, particularly for Indigenous and Black members of our communities, They've revisited old protest songs and are starting to write new ones. I really believe that engaging in arts and culture and kind of looking at this element really strengthens the intergenerational and cultural connections. But most importantly, it helps make the invisible visible, as both um, Tanis and Sherido have talked about. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Claire, for providing those really helpful current examples of some social environment principles in action. Rounding out our panel, I would like to introduce Dina K. Benno. Dina is a community development specialist with the city of Abbotsford. Emily, if you could um, flip back to the previous slide with the pictures on it. She oversees the city's housing, homelessness and community infrastructure development unit, as well as the hub of the Fraser Valley Community Entity Secretariat. The question Dina will be responding to is, how can the framework support a collaborative intersectoral approach and application of equity and sustainability values in practice? What are the outcomes that can be achieved in taking such an approach? Over to you, Dina. Thank you so much, Janice and Sherido. This has been excellent work, and I think this framework is going to be invaluable, especially for local communities. And so a specific example to Abbotsford is the Abbotsford Homelessness Prevention and Response System. It's a community owned, invested and mobilized approach. So that means it is not owned by one level of government or agency, but collectively as a community, we align shared uh, resources across systems and sectors and agencies to respond to issues of homelessness and vulnerability in our community. Currently together with our community of agencies and organizations through an ecosystems approach, we're looking at the intersectionality and relationship between a social process or social environment and built outcomes. So our work is focused on community infrastructure. So ensuring that there's appropriate levels of built social community 
and communications infrastructure that are accessible um, by multiple agencies, individuals, and families uh, to access housing, health, transportation, food systems, community integration supports, and participation opportunities. All of this work is fundamentally um, linked to four main principles that are again embedded through both policy and practice and that's equity, inclusion, reconciliation, and restorative practice. And so some examples that have emerged uh, is the Abbotsford Community Van Initiative. It, we have a often mobilized with cornerstone agencies or steward leaders. Um, Archway Community Services is our cornerstone agency and they have been mobilized in conjunction with over 50 community organizations that actively participate in our system to provide vulnerable individuals and families with access to transportation, especially during COVID through a respectful uh, service delivery model. So individuals and families are able to access health appointments, employment, community participation. Uh, in addition, we've mobilized our food system all the way from field to food security and food literacy. And so that's across systems working together. Um, in order to provide that, those access opportunities and to maximize um, our potential collectively. This uh, promotes health um, and resiliency, but also looks, continuously explores those barriers to access and equity that emerge um, over time and in between the silos and systems that we all encounter and work in. So we really look forward to embedding um, this framework in our ongoing work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dina. That was that was really inspiring. It's so great to hear about um, the intersectoral work that's happening in Abbotsford. Those were some fantastic reflections. Thank you so much, Pam and Claire and Dina for sharing those with us today. Um, I see some questions that have come in. And the first one I'm going to direct towards Pam. So Pam, um, Sylvia is curious to learn more about the health impact assessment you did for the park. Did you use an established framework or develop it for this project specifically? And I'll pass it over to you to answer. Hi, uh, yes, I did use a very specific one. It's from a CDC, uh, Center for Disease Control out of the States, and it's the Parks and uh, Trails Health Impact Assessment. And I did it very intentionally. It's not, um, I think those that have ever done a health impact assessment know how broad they can be, but this one was um, a more simple health impact assessment that I felt would be applicable for the multiple departments with multiple roles that the two municipalities, uh, the participants from the two municipalities had. So that's why I used it. I can, I'll provide a link to that afterwards. That's great. Thank you so much, Pam. So we have another question. Um, Jana is curious to know if there is any collaboration, partnership or stakeholder um, engagement with age-friendly BC communities. So this is um, a fabulous question. And I think one of the things, so we, we have a wide range of stakeholders on our advisory group, certainly. And we have discussed how we can apply this framework um, to different communities. And as I was mentioning in my introductory comments, we really wanted to create something that different communities could um, apply for their unique populations. Um, so in terms of age-friendly BC communities and the application, I think one of the things that we want to do, and Jody will speak to this more when we're talking about the next steps and the hard launch in the new year, is to provide some um, uh, even greater examples of how the framework can be applied. So this particular framework is about the what, what are the principles, what does the evidence say about what we need to do, and then in terms of how we best need to implement it, there are many organizations that we would want to turn 
turn to who have expertise in community engagement, for example, how do you engage particularly in a time of COVID in a meaningful and inclusive way? How do you engage with particular populations? And so that's certainly another phase of the work. We're not quite there yet, but we certainly have it in mind in terms of um, how the how the the framework can be applied and we would want to be drawing on our wide range of partners um, to help support that implementation and give us advice and direction about how best to do that that was a long-winded answer <laughs> um okay so we have a question from rita Hi, Rita. Um, Rita is curious to know if we've looked at whether there are jurisdictions that have better outcomes for social connectedness and whether there have been any studies to tease out what distinguishes them. Um, so very early work, Rita. Great question. Um, the whole issue of the outcomes, as I mentioned, could be another whole webinar. Um, we're sort of in the very early stages of kind of sketching out what the different categories of outcomes were be, would be. And as I mentioned, we, we want communities to be looking at um, it, uh, outcomes and indicators that cross population health, community well-being, as well as social connectedness, and then all of the values as well. So not quite there. Um, our lit review to date has really focused on um, coming up with contents to support the creation of the actual principles in the framework. So um, it, it is another one of those pieces of the puzzle where we're really hoping to connect with different organizations um, who have that expertise in, in uh, evaluation, creation of evaluation frameworks and assessment going forward. Okay, we've got a question from Lori, who's asking, could someone give an example of community programming that celebrates diverse people and culture? Um, I think I would open this one up to Pam or Claire or Dina, if you wanted to take that one on. Do the three of you, do either, do any of the three of you have an example you could share? Um, it's Claire here. I think, um, especially in community programming, I think that's where the, the strength of some of the arts-based programming can be very powerful. And some of these examples of the um, seniors-based planning has really had a, a remarkable impact over time. So I think bringing together different groups it, uh, with programming, especially with food and in the arts, um, that's, that's a very tangible way for people to celebrate their lives and culture. Anis, I have a quick COVID response example I could share. Sure. sure. So with respect to the COVID response efforts in Abbotsford um, and Mission for COVID response, we've worked closely with our local Indigenous communities to determine what, what funding could support um, response efforts specific to communities, um, as well as with, we have a significant um, South Asian community as well, a mission in Abbotsford. So one thing was to put together care packs um, for COVID response that will have been circulated out into throughout our shelter systems, our transition houses, and also to individual households who may be isolated. And so those include cultural items like winter medicine bundles or um, support for New Year cleansing, um, and also some specific food items or items of comfort um, that the communities have identified as um, a comfort need as well. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. I'm looking at another question from Jana, who's asking, can I use this framework as a results measurement indicator? Do I have permission to use it? So let me answer the second question first. Um, one of the reasons that we wanted to 
um, schedule and provide this soft launch as we wanted to get this material out into the world as soon as possible. We haven't quite finished the final report yet. We're still putting the finishing touches on it that will provide a lot more detail and context around the principles that we're going to share with you. But we've heard from so many stakeholders that they found value in the framework that we wanted to share it so that you could use. So yes, absolutely, please go take this version one and use it in any way that you would find helpful. And in terms of the results measurements indicator, um, absolutely, you know, like I said, we're in uh, all we've been able to provide at this point is some high level thinking around those outcome categories that we would recommend organizations, communities considering when they're putting, to putting together an evaluation framework. But yes, absolutely, please do um, take what we've started and build on it. And if you wanted to share with us um, the work that you're doing and how it turns out, we would really appreciate that as well. Okay, um, we are getting close to the end of time. Do we have more, a, a few more minutes for questions or should we be wrapping up? I'm just looking for some guidance on time for one more question. Um, okay, how does the framework address the need for social emotional learning and other educational ways to improve the way people relate to each other? as much as social isolation comes from toxic interrelations and unethical conduct between people. I'm looking to some of my advisory group members to take on this question. I, I'll, I'll refer to our advisory group members as well, but I just wanted to um, just observe that a, a big part of the framework um, uh, is about relationship building. And yeah. we, we align with the Indigenous perspective around two-eyed seeing, that if you are work in relationship to other people, you are those types of toxic interrelations and unethical conduct that you're talking about becomes so much less uh, likely to happen. That we, if we put ourselves in the role of other people and understand their behavior or their motivations from their perspective, there's a different type of learning that uh, lends itself to compassion. And I think that just that experience is what we need more than any kind of formal social emotional learning, but uh, the empathy and the sense of humility that we're advocating in terms of this framework, um, I think will do a lot to address those things. And I agree that we need to address them. Yeah. Thank and you. It's, Pam, it's Pam, if I can just make one comment. I think that this also talks to the um, importance of um, authentic community uh, engagement so that you do hear all of the voices and those voices have the same uh, power at the discussion as everyone else. And my, my final final is that I think that's why we put together this framework is to make people make sure that there is a way of recognizing that and building it in more formally into processes. Yeah, that's great. Thanks everyone for reminding us of that. No, thank you so much for all your questions and the engagement. I'm thrilled you were all able to join us today. I'm feeling energized and excited to keep going with this work. And I, I think all of the advisory group members are. Um, I'm, unfortunately, we've run out of time and I'm gonna pass it back to Jody to wrap up and talk about some of the next steps. Jody, over to you. Thanks so much, Sherito and Tanis for going through that today. It's a bit of a, a teaser. Um, and thanks, Pam, Claire, and Dina for also joining us and speaking to your specific experience and application of this framework. And, and again, a shout out to everyone who's part of the advisory committee and those of you that have worked as part of the project team to get this framework to where it's at. As I said, we're really excited in our work to be using it with the communities that we support across the province. Please share it widely with your colleagues and um, anyone else that you know that you think it would be useful to. And 
Yeah, really just thank you. I know everyone's really busy right now and there's a lot of extra work on your desks. Um, we appreciate your time and your attention this morning, spending this time with us. And we really just like to send you out to the rest of your day and have a great rest of your day. So thank you so much.